Welcome back to the channel, everybody, or just welcome if this is your first time. I appreciate you guys stopping by the channel. This is Each One, Reach One, hoping to teach and reach one, Lord willing, of course. So uh, we are back for another venture into Bible prophecy, going into the Old Testament to get the true word of the Most High God, as thus saith the Most High God, and not thus saith Christian doctrine or the doctrines of men. All right, before we start, we're going to go into our disclaimer to solidify how the Most High feels about his word so that we can eradicate the ungodly belief that the, the Old Testament prophecies are no longer applicable. All right, so let's begin. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. The Most High God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? As you should know by now, these are rhetorical questions. Because the Most High God absolutely intends to follow through with his word. If he says something, he's going to do it. If he's spoken it, he's going to make it good. He doesn't say anything without purpose and intent to carry through. All right. So Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn. He's given his word, his oath, his promise saying, surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. Shall means guarantee, means absolutely, means definitely, means count on it. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. That's very clear, right? There's no room for debate. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Absolutely nobody. It can't be done. But Christianity tries very hard. Anybody, anybody, absolutely anybody, no matter who it is, if your mother tells you that the prophecies of God are done away with, run fast and run far, have no further dealings with her. Your mother is a vessel of Satan and she's showing you. And it's better to cut off all ties with her than to be cast into the lake of fire with her. Trust me, you're not, you, you don't love her that much. You better not love her that much because when you're in that lake of fire, you're going to be loathing yourselves and cursing her out and wishing that you have separated yourselves from her. All right. So Isaiah 55 and 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. All right. So pretty clear, right? All right. Now let's get to it. Isaiah chapter 48. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth, nor in righteousness. For they call themselves of the holy city, and stay themselves upon the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. So this is talking about our people in a time past. Not in the present. All right. Got to understand what time period these things are talking about. He's talking to our, our people in this particular time and about what they were doing, what they were going through. So he's letting them know why he's going to do to them what he's going to do to them is because of what they've done. This is important to establish because when the Israelites transgressed, when the Israelites were in wickedness, they were promised uh, punishment and judgment. And then he turned around and made good on his promises of punishment and judgment. And just the same, in the latter times, judgment and punishment is promised for all the enemies of Israel. All the Gentile and heathen nations are promised judgment and punishment. And he will make good on it the same way he made good on his promise to his own people for their wickedness. He's going to keep keep his word about his promise concerning your judgment 
for your wickedness. Let us continue. I have declared the former things from the beginning and they went forth out of my mouth and I showed them and I did them suddenly and they came to pass. You heard that? I declared the former things from the beginning. Talking about giving his prophecy. He shows himself to men via prophecy. He proves himself. That's how he lets you know that he is God. I call things before they happen to show you that I am God. And I also don't do anything without giving a warning first of what's to come. This is what he does as well. And then he makes good on his warnings. That's his way. So as you see, he says, they went forth out of my mouth. And we know what he says about the word that goes forth out of his mouth, right? It shall accomplish that which he sent it to do. And he says, and I showed them, I did them suddenly and they came to pass because he had to come to pass because it went forth out of his mouth. That's the way it works. His word does not come back unto him void. Get that through your heads. Old Testament prophecies are applicable. They are not to be thrown away because I knew that thou art obstinate and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass, hard-headed, hard-headed, stubborn, stiff-necked Israelites just wouldn't do right and were punished. I have even from the beginning declared it unto thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou shouldest say, mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. So he says, I give you these prophecies, so you know that I am God and not your idols. You know that I'm responsible for these things that are taking place and not your idols. Your idols didn't declare these things unto you from the beginning. I did. So my prophecies are a way of me proving to you that I am the God to, to uh, fear, to respect, to worship, to honor, to praise, to glorify, right? His prophecies is how he speaks to us and, 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 and declares himself, establishes himself, proves himself. Thou hast heard, see all this, and will not ye declare it? Right? Thou hast heard, right? See all this, and will not ye declare it? Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to declare the things that he show us. I have showed thee new things from this time, even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. They are created now and not from the beginning, even before the day when thou heardest them not, lest thou shouldest say, behold, I knew them. As he knows his people. He knows people in general. He knows that that's exactly what they would have done. So certain things he's saying that I hid from you, and I'm only declaring it to you right now. I didn't give you the prophecies before, but I'm going to declare it to you right now. So that you can say, yeah, 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 I knew that already. I knew that before you even said it. And then you don't give him his credit. You don't give him him the, the respect that's due for that thing that took place because you're going to give the credit for it to your idols, to some false god. And he's not going to allow that to happen. Yea, thou heardest not. Yea. Thou knewest not, yea, from that time that thine ear was not opened, for I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. What did he say? For I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously. See, because the most God, high God, he knows us. He's not taken by surprise with anything that we do. So he knows everything that we're gonna do. So his promises about what he would do for, for Israel was taken into account. The fact that they would deal very treacherously, that they would sin and transgress and commit iniquity. But he says, I will not forsake you still. I will blot out your transgressions. That's what he said he would do because he knew what we would do always. So that Christian philosophy um, that says the Israelites 
persecuted or they killed Christ or they rejected him. And so they were rejected. That's a doctrine of Satan. The most high God has not rejected his people. He didn't say that he would do that. You can't find that anywhere in the book. That's Satan's doctrine. So if it's yours, you know who you belong to. For my name's sake, Israel, will I will I defer mine anger? And for my praise, will I refrain thee? See, he says, I will defer my anger, not I will hold on to anger forever. For my name's sake, will I defer mine anger? And for my praise, will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off? Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have tested thee. I have proved thee. I have purged away your dross, your impurities, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. What did he do with Israel? He's chosen Israel in the furnace of affliction. What does that mean? Right? The furnace is, is what he used, because he, he, he says that he would, is basically hell, the condition of hell, right? Our low, our low state and going through the worst of times and being beaten down and enslaved and all the evil that we experienced throughout all these generations. That was him refining us. That was him choosing us in the furnace of affliction. He didn't send every other nation through the furnace of affliction. What the other nations went through was at the hands, you know, was at the hands of their own people and their own people denied them the opportunity to enjoy their heaven. So if you, if you want to say, well, you know, I'm white or I'm whatever it is my nationality is. And, you know, and but I didn't have it great. And my people didn't all have it great. And, you know, my family, you know, we struggled and we this and we that. Well, you got to blame your own people for that. It's the same way we have to, to, to put the blame on our forefathers. Well, your forefathers denied you the ability to have your heaven because they're so wicked instead of using their rulership to take care of all of their people and make sure that all their people were able to live a great life, they were selfish, they were greedy, and they wanted to, to have it for themselves. So they denied you the ability to have a great life. But this was all of this time that the Israelites were down was your time to be up. You were on the up end of the seesaw, right? In order for you to be up, the Israelites have to be down. When Israelites are down, that's when you get to go up. And when the Israelites go up, you got to come down. That's the way it works. So when the Israelites were down, that was your time. That was the time for all the other nations to have their time of prosperity. And if you didn't get to enjoy and partake of the pot of prosperity, that was because of your the wickedness of your own people. They robbed you. You didn't go through the furnace of affliction from the most high God. You were done wrong by your people. Verse 11, for mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it? For how should my name be polluted? See, he says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I told you what I'm going to do and I'm going to do it for my own sake. Will I do it? Guarantee. He's telling you, I'm going to do it for how should my name be polluted? And how will I not, and, and I will not give my glory into another. He's saying, and I will not give the, the glory of being called Israel to another people. I will not give my Holy Spirit to another people. I will not make another people my people. I'm not going to trade in the people that I've chosen for another people and, and surname them Israel, to say that they're the new spiritual Israelites. I'm not going to do that. So, there seems to be a doctrine out there that didn't come from God. The Most High says that he would not give his glory to another people. That means another people besides the biblical Israelites, the ancient Israelites, which seed is still in the earth today being called by words like nigger and Negro and African-American 
Afro-American, colored, right? Black, you name it. All of these different names they've come up with for us to keep from having to call us by what we are called, by the Most High God, which is Israel. How shall my name be polluted? That's why he took his name from us when we were in sin. He didn't allow us to continue to pollute his name. So he took it from us because we were in sin. And so if we were in sin and he didn't want his name to be polluted, what do you think, how do you think he feels about these other people who are calling themselves Israel, but yet they're taking place in all sorts of unrighteousness and wickedness, homosexuality and gay prides and being the, the, uh, the gay, the gay capital of the world and all manner of wickedness, such as, you know, Christ blasphemy and saying that his son is in hell boiling in excrement and all manner of wickedness. All of these things that they do all around the world, all the wickedness that they have their hands a part of, you know, putting their mouths on babies' penises and calling it a righteous thing, you know, to circumcise a baby and then put their mouths on them to suck the blood off of their penises. Like, you think that sound godly to you? You can't go in the Bible and find that practice anywhere. But yet they have it and they will argue with you and fight you to the death to have the right to that practice. That's disgusting. And that being tied to the name Israel is pollution. It is polluting his name. He took the name from us. And that's the reason why we're called everything but Israel to this day. And you think he would allow, he would give his name to those people and allow them to pollute his name? That's all they're doing is polluting the name Israel. That's why they're going to be in trouble. Oh, that, that rod of iron, that whipping stick. Oh, it will be used on them for sure. But he says, and I will not give my glory unto another. So Christians, you're not getting, you, you will not get to inherit the kingdom. You will not get to take the place of the Israelites in the kingdom. You are not grafted in to the, the family and the Israelites are thrown out. You do not get to replace the children of Israel. It doesn't happen. That doctrine is not godly. Verse 12. Look at the, look at the subject matter, first of all. Deliverance promised. There's a promise of Israel, the bloodline Israelites being delivered from their persecutions, oppression, and captivities. So that means they're going to be a people in need of deliverance. When Christ comes, doesn't look like those other people are in need of deliverance. Look like they are already in their land, but the real Israelites are not supposed to be in their own land, having control and power of their own government, having a military force nuclear might the power of the dollar their hands in in everybody's business all around the world the power to influence all these things that they have the biblical israelites are not supposed to have not the true israelites of the bible they're not supposed to have these things hearken unto me O jacob and israel my called who are his called jacob israel not the christian believers in christ israel the bloodline i am he I am the first, I also am the last. My hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. All ye, assemble yourselves and hear, which among them hath declared these things. The Lord hath loved him. He will do his pleasure on Babylon, meaning I'm going to keep my word to destroy Babylon. I told you I was going to do it. And I'm going to do it. The Lord will do his pleasure on Babylon. And his pleasure is to destroy them. And his arm shall be on the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken. Yea, I have called him. I have brought him. And he shall make his way prosperous. Come ye near unto me. Hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I, and now the Lord God and his spirit hath sent me. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, 
I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Thy seed also had been as the sand and the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. His name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before thee. What is this saying? The name of God was cut off from the Israelites, destroyed from before them so that they couldn't call on him, so that we couldn't call on him. But those other people who call themselves Israel, they say that they can they can trace their lineage all the way back to King David and that they've always spoken Hebrew. They've never not had their language or their customs. They've had the Torah since forever. They've never not had it. But Most High God says, I'm going to cut you off, and be, you know what I'm saying, from, from your heritage. I'm going to destroy my name from among you. I'm going to cut my name off from among you. So which people match the scripture? We are the ones that forgot we were Israelites. We forgot the name of the Most High God. We forgot our language. Those other people claim that they haven't forgotten anything. They haven't had anything taken away from them or cut off from them. They're liars. They're fraudulent. They're counterfeit. And the Most High God is revealing to you that they are counterfeit, that they do not fit the prophecies. Now you have to, you have to, uh, to grapple with the truth, and you have to decide what's more important to you: the truth or your comfortable lies, the truth or your ignorant blanket that you that you uh, snuggle up in every day to feel better. What's more important: the truth of God. Or the lies that you've been told. Do you do you really love God? Or do you love Satan? You got decisions to make. What are you going to do? Are you going to try to walk down the path of righteousness? Even if it means turning your back on all that you've known before? Turning your back on people? The Christian church? The doctrines that you were married to? If you're not going to turn your back on all of that, you can't call yourself a child of Christ, a child of God, a lover of God, nor a follower of Christ. You can't. You can't. You can't really call yourself a Christian in the true sense of the, the, the term Christian. Oh, but you can be a Christian in today's worldly definition of what a Christian is, meaning someone from the religion of Christianity. But initially, it meant follower of Christ. You are not a follower of Christ. Well, not Christ, Yahweh Shad, maybe Christ, Jesus, that false God, right? But not the God of this Bible, though. Oh, uh, okay, there we go. I can't remember what. Go ye forth of Babylon. Flee ye from the Chaldeans with the voice of singing, declare ye, tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. Listen to this again. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans. Why is he saying this? Because the Israelites are in Babylon. Even again, even in the Christian circles, they understand that America is Babylon. So if you admit that America is Babylon, the Chaldeans will have to be the Americans. And what does this also mean? This means that the Israelites are a people in America and they would be the lowest people in, in America. They would be people who were taken captive by the Americans. 
taken captive by those who call themselves the Americans. And, and you know, for a fact, you, these white folks in this country, when they say Americans, they mean white people. They don't say Americans and they mean they include black people. No, no, no. They say Americans and they mean Europeans, those of European descent. That's why I used it that way. Right? Because the Most High is using it that way. He's telling his people, go forth of Babylon. Flee ye from the Chaldeans. He's telling us to depart from the ways of this place. Depart from you people in it. We're supposed to separate from you. And he says, with a voice of singing, declare ye. Tell this. Not keep a secret. Not be shy about it. No. Declare this, utter it, even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. Doesn't say declare this to the end of the earth that the Lord has redeemed his servant, the Christian church, the followers of Christ. No, he points right to the bloodline of the man Jacob, the seed of Jacob, and calls them his servant. It's very clear. And they thirsted not when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He claved the rock also and the waters gushed out. Can you guess why he's saying this? I'm going to tell you why he's saying this. He's saying this because he knows that in this time, the Christian mind would immediately start doing mental gymnastics to try to make this apply to them. They're going to say, no, no, no. This means spiritual Jacobites. I'm, a, I'm of the seed of Jacob because I'm a believer in Christ. I follow Christ. So, you know, I'm, since I'm a believer, that makes me of Israel. He knew that they would say this, that they would justify their position this way. So then in verse 21, he states, and they, who? Jacob. Thirsted not when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He's talking about when Moses was leading them out of uh, Egypt through the wilderness and then to the promised land to let you know that he's talking about the bloodline. He's talking about the actual Israelites. So there can be no confusion about who he's talking about. Your pastor, can, your pastor cannot turn around and say, this is talking about the believers in Christ when he turns around and he specifies that these are the people that, are, that were brought up out of Egypt. These are the people that Moses led. Right? That he caused the waters to flow out of the rock for. He's talking about those people. And then he says, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. So you hear constantly him, the Most High God, telling his people to fear not. He's constantly trying to soothe his people and telling them not to fear in the latter days. But he's saying here, there is no peace, said the Lord, unto the wicked. Let's get Job chapter 9, verse 24. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. If the earth is given into the hand of the wicked, who are the wicked? Well, who are the people that rule the earth? Look around, take account. Which people are up above everybody else? Who are the highest people in the land? That's the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. Who does? The wicked. And what does it mean that he covers the faces of the judges thereof? It means that he's hiding the Israelites. They lie about who the Israelites really are. They're covering the faces of the judges because the judges are the Israelites. The wicked covereth the faces. They have whitewashed history. They have stolen the true history of the Israelites, called them Negroes now, say that their history is really another people's history. So now that means they have covered the faces of the judges. There is another face on top of the face underneath the face, <laughs> right? So just imagine that. Imagine seeing a drawing and the drawing has a black person there or black people. And then now imagine those same images being painted over 
in the image and the likeness of white people, of European people. This is what the wicked have done. We bear the record that we are the children of God. The Israelites are a people who their history has been covered up and their, their identity has been stolen. Everybody's working hard to cover up their identity, to keep them hidden. We know, we know who it is. And he says, if not, where and who is he? Meaning, if these people who have done this to the Israelites are not the wicked, then who are they and where are they? Meaning, these are indeed the wicked. So he's telling you who the wicked are and you know them by their fruit. You know them by what they have done. And what did they do? They took the Israelites captive and then they stole their identity. They did the old trading places, the face swap. They did the old face swap. Here, you, you take my heritage, I'm going to take yours. You take my image and I'm going to take yours. You take my history and I'm going to take yours. I'm going to give you my ways, my habits, my customs, my traditions, and I'm going to take yours. So now you got the Israelites walking around here being in utter dysfunction because we are walking around with the belief systems and, and the nature of our enemies. You take on the nature of your oppressors if you've been in captivity long enough. This is not our nature that you're watching. This is the nature of our enemies. But mind you, we have not been perfect and wholesome. We have been guilty of doing things that made us worthy of our judgments. And the Most High was merciful to not destroy us utterly as he should have. That's why I love him and we're all supposed to love him and appreciate him for sparing us not according to our own righteousness, but because of his, his love for us. So if you are of his people, you got to appreciate him and glorify him for what he has done for you. The sacrifice of the cross, that was for you. You didn't deserve it. You deserve to die. And he purchased everlasting life for you. You're supposed to be eternally grateful. Turn back to your power. Admit your sins and the sins of your forefathers and acknowledge your offense our offenses seek him early why he can still be sought because the time draweth nigh when it's going to be too late with that said what do we know a promise made is a promise kept by the most high god if he says it he's going to do it all praise honor and glory to the holy one of israel and redeemer the god of abraham isaac and jacob our fathers Yahweh and our King Yahweh Shai. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of all your blessings upon us, grace and, and peace, and many blessings to the saints. Our redemption is soon to come. Look up, it draws nigh. Shalom.